I'm Stephanie Chastine. I'm with the Science Education Initiative at the University of Colorado at Boulder. This is a short video uh, to outline a workshop that we did on effective facilitation techniques using clickers. Um, this was done along with Steve Pollock, a colleague of mine in the physics department here at CU Boulder. Um, this workshop is specifically geared to help people learn how to use clickers effectively in the classroom. You can watch this video if you would like to find out about the content, if you're an instructor wanting to learn more about using clickers, or if you're a faculty developer and want to see how it is that we do our workshops. All of the interactive components of the um, workshop have been cut out, so participant discussion and such um, has been removed for length. But just so you know, we do do those as parts of the workshop. So please uh, enjoy the workshop. Um, so I first want to tell you what you're not going to learn about today. Um, this is not a, a workshop about writing good questions. So the, point, the topic of today's um, workshop is really about how to effectively facilitate it in the classroom. Um, so if you've got, uh, you've got your questions al already and you're trying to make it um, work to its best advantage with your students. So that's what we'll be focusing on. So um, first off, I just want to, I know that we just went through, through this, but I want to highlight that there are a couple, there are different ways of asking questions. So one way is sort of the good old typical um, raising of hands. So who's in science? Who's in engineering? Who's in social sciences? Who's in humanities? Anything else? So that's sort of a nice way to get a bit quick visual. It's not anonymous, but that question didn't need to be. If you haven't used clickers before, um, you want to take it, you want to turn it on, a little on-off button. Um, and I'll give you a moment to, to read the question and, uh, and think about it. Um, but go ahead and vote in with your choice. So. Um, I'll just show you the, the histogram. So um, you know, most people say that you're not using it at all, but there really is a wide range. Nobody answered E, but if Steve had voted, hopefully he would have answered E. <laughs> um, I forgot to bring my colored cards um, to demonstrate how you can answer with colored cards, but what we have is, a, is usually a piece of paper that's divided into, into four colored blocks with A, B, C, D on each one, and students can fold it um, and share their vote um, with that colored card. So um, we'll go ahead and just do this with clickers. Um, uh, and I'm not gonna tell you what I think peer instruction is. I just started it. Um, just tell me how familiar you think you are with peer instruction. So anyone who hasn't used um, iClicker before, just so you know, um, I do have a sneak preview of your responses on this little device before I even show you the histogram. So if I wanted to facilitate some discussion about this question, I've got your answers um, to help me decide how to facilitate that discussion. Um, this isn't really a discussion type of question, so I'm just going to show you, um, you know, that we've got a, a wide range um, of familiarity, but most people are not that familiar. So we're going to make sure to cover what we mean by peer instruction, because um, that is the method that we use um, of teaching with clickers. Um, but we're going to try to breeze past it fairly quickly so that we can really get into the meat of facilitation. Um, so generally, why do we question? I'm going to make this a... Um, uh, rhetorical question. I'm going to feed you some additional rhetorical questions. Um, so how many times have you given a lecture and found that students weren't following you when you felt like you were giving a pretty clear presentation? Ever happened? It would be easier to ask in the inverse. <laughs> <laughs> how many times do you give a clear lecture and everybody not? 327. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and can you rely on students to ask you a question when they're not following? No. Even worse than that, can you rely on students to know when they don't understand something? From still the dilemma. They don't know that they don't know. They don't know that they don't know. So given all that, what are some of the reasons why we want to ask students questions? Just a, just a couple ideas. To see if you have to repeat or rephrase what you just explained. Mm -hmm. So you can adjust your teaching to what it is that they're what what it is that they're understanding. To engage their brains so they actually start to learn. Nice. Until they think, until they are confused, they're not there. Yeah. So to engage their brains, you know, because 
you don't really know what it is that you understand until you try to apply that understanding. That's when you see whether there's a gap. So here's a little cartoon uh, with, with one of those reasons why you might question. You know, if you're not getting feedback from the students, you might not know that what's in their heads it doesn't match with what you were trying to present. Um, even though you felt like it was so clear. So it's one of these ways to get feedback from your students, but also importantly, um, there's an extra seat over here with the handouts and such. Um, but also importantly, um, to give feedback to your students uh, with what it is that they're understanding or they're not understanding. Um, what's special about clicker questions? Um, I just sort of outline some of the things that make this a different tool, um, you know, a useful tool for answering for asking questions. One thing I want to point out is that the goals of asking clicker questions are very similar to the goals of asking any sort of question in class. Be it a quiz, be it a verbal question that you're just throwing out for the class to consider. It's not a different type of questioning. It's a different type of questioning tool. Um, but they do tend to be multiple choice, which makes them a little bit different um, and uh, requires some strategic question design. It's really helpful that they're anonymous, um, at least to the student's peers. They don't necessarily feel that there's this worry of what other people are going to judge them for answering something if they're raising their hand for the wrong answer. So that anonymity um, is really important. Um, you know, you often, if you throw out a verbal question, you're going to hear from the students, you know, in the front who are, you know, raising their hand every time. This is a way to get a more accurate picture of how the whole class. Um, is viewing something. So you're hearing from every student. Um, one of my colleagues in the physics department, Noah Fickelstein, likes to say, I demand that every student in my class have a voice. I just limit that voice to A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, in a 200 uh, student lecture, you're pretty much limited to that. In a smaller class, this is one of many tools that you might use. Um, it forces a wait time. After you ask a question, um, oftentimes we're too quick to jump in with the answer to that question because nobody, not, none of the students um, will uh, come up with their own answer. We often just aren't giving students enough time. So this forces a gap for students to think about um, their answer to the question. Um, and you can choose when to show that histogram. That histogram is sort of the grand reveal and we'll talk about how you might choose, you know, under what conditions you might choose to show that histogram um, at the beginning of discussion, at the end of discussion, um, and it's it's a really useful way to keep students' attention and interest um, by sort of keeping that mystery of how their um, classrooms respond. So clickers are a tool for questioning. They're not going to change everything in your class. It really depends on how you use them, which is why we're giving this workshop on um, clicker facilitation and clicker use. Um, you don't want to equate the pedagogy with the technology. Now, this is the technology. Now, how do you use it? So what is the pedagogy? And this is what I'm going to give you a brief overview of peer instruction um, before we get um, deeper into the, into the use. Um, so I want to show you a, sh a short video um, that we've put together. I'll just show you the, the beginning of it. You can watch the whole thing online about what peer instruction is and why um, it is that you might want to use it. I think that clickers are the most valuable addition to my classroom I've seen in over 30 years of teaching. Clickers have absolutely changed the way we teach. I think it's now something we look forward to. It helps us to bring more innovations into our teaching. The lecture now becomes very dynamic rather than static. I'm not just a robot presenting a pre-prepared lecture. It evens the playing field a little bit. Everybody has a chance to kind of think about things and answer them at their own pace. I find that teachers that use clickers in the classroom are much more in tune to what their students are understanding and what they're not understanding. They engage students in their own learning. The students move from passively listening to my wonderful lectures to actually having to figure out things and learn them themselves. The relaxing atmosphere and the students feel like now they have a voice in the classroom. I think that is very important for students. But just what is a clicker? Clickers are basically a real-time poll of your class, which helps them learn. Let's give you a brief snapshot of how it's run. Several times in each lecture, the instructor pauses and asks the class a challenging question on the material. 
Students chat with their neighbors for a few minutes to help them figure out the answer, and then they click in with their choice. Instructors can get a record of every student's answer. A real-time histogram is created showing the class response as a whole. The instructor discusses the question with the class and moves on from there. What if they're spinning opposite ways the clickers are good for many reasons, but one of the simplest is there's accountability. Everyone knows that their discussion answer is going to be recorded, and so they're all talking about the science. They're not talking about Saturday night. They're talking about astronomy. The clickers seem to be a really nice way to keep me focused and attentive in class. They kind of get me out of that sort of slump position in my seat and make me think about something. Clickers allow students, well in fact they encourage students to commit to an answer. And um, they can't go into this sort of natural human mode of, oh yeah, I knew that, because they voted and they know what they voted just a minute earlier. The most immediate benefit from the clickers is you learn what your students are thinking. Clickers help me understand the issues of the students who wouldn't speak as much otherwise. I also get to interact with the students next to me, which, I mean, when I explain a concept to them, it helps me understand it more myself. I think the clicker really helps because it facilitates communication between each of the students. I have to learn by thinking or doing it myself, and that really only happens in classes with clicker questions. It's certainly valuable that answers to clicker questions are anonymous. Even when you raise a card or you raise your hands, you're still conscious of everybody around you. The anonymity really helps because you're not being put on the spot. There's no fear of being judged if you get a question wrong. So um, that goes, the video continues to go through a couple of other advantages of clickers. We have another video that's all about effective use of clickers that really gets into a lot of the facilitation stuff. But I just sort of wanted to show you that as the, the brief snapshot of, of what peer instruction is. So um, in peer instruction, um, you, in the midst of your lecture, you'll ask students a question. Um, they'll vote on their own. Some, sometimes that gets uh, skipped, but it's important to at least give students a, a chance to consider what their answer would be um, on their own. Um, and then they turn to their neighbors. So that's the key part about the peer instruction. They're turning to their neighbors and arguing why they chose the particular answer that they chose. Then they'll vote, or it'll be a re-vote if they've already voted. Um, and then you have a whole class discussion um, where um, people get a chance to uh, discuss the reasonings behind all of the different answers. Okay, um, so uh, I want to show you briefly a little bit of the the, the research behind um, peer instruction because we may not get to some of the details. Because after all, we don't want to just blindly do instructional change. We want instructional change that's based on research um, and evidence. So um, you know, we don't want just any old change. Um, so I want to give you a, a few of the key findings from the research on, on peer instruction. So a bunch of different research points to peer instruction as being a useful um, instructional technique. Oops, I was going to animate those one by one. Oh well. Um, so uh, ignore the other ones because otherwise it's cognitive overload. Um, so, th so the first one, students can answer a similar question better after talking to their peers. Why do we care about that? That means that students actually learn something from talking to their neighbors. So if you test them in a way by asking them a similar question on the same topic, they do better after talking to their neighbors. So it's not just that they're getting the answer from their neighbors, it's that they're actually learning and able to apply that learning to a new question. So great, discussing with your neighbors helps you learn. Um, it's really important though not to just have that peer discussion, but also for you as the instructor at the end to weigh in on what the right answer is and why, or why you favor a particular answer. Um, if there is just instructor explanation, if students just vote and then you explain without having the, them talk to their neighbors, or if they just talk to their neighbors but the instructor never gives the feedback, neither of those is, is as effective as putting the two together. Um, students like pre-instruction, and we find that at the intro level up through the junior and senior level. I can't remember if we asked the grads. We have. Uh, okay. So we've, we've done this in graduate atomic and molecular physics, and it was very popular. Okay. Um, but, you know, your mileage so may vary. I, I it's <laughs> an enough. example of grad students who are open for it. Um, and we've also found that um, students who had a class without clickers, we asked, would you like to add clickers? Sometimes they're like, no, 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 it's fine as it is. Then you add clickers and they feel like it's really effective. They're like, oh, keep it like this. So students don't always know what the benefit of clickers will be a priori. 
Um, and peer instruction, if you look at courses using peer instruction, students in those courses outperform students in traditionally taught lecture courses on a common test. So lots of evidence to suggest that this is an effective teaching technique. So I just wanted to give you a, a sense of some of that research. That, some of that research. Um, this, is, this website is in your handout. It says stemclickers.colorado.edu, um, which also links to the stemvideos.colorado.edu. We have a bunch of these videos on effective use. We have instructor uh, resources. We have clicker question banks that you can look at to get ideas. We have copies of this instructor resource guide, which you can download as a PDF. Um, and uh, past workshops and literature, so good place to know about. I'm going to show you some example questions. We're not going to answer them. We'll do a test peer instruction question um, amongst ourselves. Here's an example question from physics. Just give you a chance to read it. So you might think about in in what classroom setting would this be a useful question, and and what's the pedagogical value of this question? It may not look like the kind of question you imagined a physics clicker question would look like. I know instructors have used this um, as a um, beginning question, the beginning of the semester, for example, to get students warmed up to the idea of talking with their neighbors. This is a really low stakes question. There's no wrong answer. Um, and it's clear that it's about talking about it. So you, you know, it can be a useful question to frame in the beginning. What's another way that you might use such a well, question? I, I've used this question except I changed D. Uh, when, I, when I was finished with electricity and starting uh, magnetism in an, in an introductory e and class, um, to try to assess whether students had some idea about connecting these abstract ideas to real world, it, it was a very entertaining discussion. Students were far more creative than I, than I was um, in terms of thinking about what good it would do to, to do these things. Thanks. So here's an example in literature. Uh, humanities folks, give you a chance to read it. <laughs> so this was listed as a synthesis question on the website that I, that I took it from, um, from which I would imagine that an instructor would use this not like right after he talked about the answer to it, but rather they've learned about these authors they're bringing up this example, and now they're having to both apply and put together two different kinds of ideas in order to uh, come up with the answer to this question. Here's a math question. I might you read it? So just to sort of give away the punchline on this one so that you understand what this question is trying to get at, this is something you would be um, uh, giving a statistics class after you talked about probability. Um, the uh, right answer is C, because there's two different ways to get a girl and a boy. You could have like twin A be a girl and twin B be a boy, or twin A be a boy and twin B be a girl. Um, so um, that uh, adds up to more probability of getting C. But the sort of intuitive way to answer is like D, or I get a lot of A because people just know more twin boys. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> So it can be well, people have heard that there's a small statistical right. difference between boy and girl births. Right. I think that, that, that that's what we're after. Right. So, so it ends up being a good way to, to actually apply some ideas about probability. So here's a, another, um, uh, this is probably more of a history, history or, or ethics question. I'll give you a chance to read it. So clearly a very different kind of clicker question where there's not necessarily a, a right or wrong answer that you're after here. It's, it's all about the discussion. Yeah. So this might be to get students to apply um, some uh, abstract idea to like what it is that they really think about the subject, or maybe it's to lead into a subject um, to really sort of generate some rich discussion. Um, so I want us to try, try doing a peer instruction together, uh, peer instruction question together. Um, but I want it to be something that actually applies to you guys. So I want you to just think on your own for a moment. What do you think the toughest thing about using clickers and peer instruction in class is or will be? Just think on your own um, for a moment what you think is your best answer to that. But most likely what you were thinking of is not A through E. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm going to now ask you to um, pick one of A through E that if, if it's not the closest to what you were thinking, at least it's the one to which you most strongly um, connect. 
and will start off doing it by yourself, for yourself. T talk to your neighbors. Um, you know, talk to the nearest person or two persons and um, sh share your own opinion, listen to their reasons, and you can change your mind. I'm going to reopen the vote. So you can let me know that you feel like your conversation is done by voting again. And you can vote the same thing, or maybe you've just changed your mind because of your conversation. Your first time. <laughs> Can I get you to you a I think it's it's okay to show the distribution here. Um, um, a and E are popular with a one person um, uh, worrying about D. I, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time about this right now because we're going to be coming back to um, um, what's tough about using clickers throughout the rest of the workshop. But let's have a brief discussion about you, what you were talking about in your groups. I'd like to hear, sort of, first of all, whether you just wanted something else on this list, <laughs> and or what is it about these that is bothering you? We all agreed it was A. <laughs> okay, and and reason yeah. So so, you, so get, then we, you get a prize for being the first to speak up. Yeah, <laughs> we went through the others just so we have something to discuss. But we all know the questions. Okay, um, and um, so that seems to be the consensus of h half the group. Um, so so l let's hear from somebody who doesn't think that writing I, questions I, is the crux. I even changed my vote to E from, from A. From A to E, and what? Yeah, well, just because um, it, it initially hadn't occurred to me that mm -hmm. the, the takes too long issue might be there. But you know, when I'm teaching Western Civ, I'm covering 3,000 years of history in 15 weeks, and it, you know, it, it's hard to get through the material and my lectures tend to run too long and I try to cram too much information in as it is. And so how do I take all these long pauses? Um, I want to mention that all you folks who are answering A, writing good questions, that is actually one of the number one challenges that people who are currently using clickers mentions as something that they struggle with. Um, so it, 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 it is a struggle. Now, I'm not going to ask you to answer this question. Um, I want you to think for a moment, are you going to change anything about what it is that you uh, do in your, you know, in your implementation of peer instruction? Um, and I just want to mention, you know, there's not necessarily a huge problem with modifying um, this technique if you're strategic about why you're modifying it. Um, the problem is that a lot of people who decide to modify uh, the peer instruction tend to take out really important things like the peer discussion part, um, which is what the research shows makes this an effective technique. So um, just be it careful. Takes so long. Yeah, because it takes so long. But at the same time, that's where the meat of it is. So um, just be strategic um, and careful. We don't want to give you like a set of tips and tricks and techniques that are basically like a list of facts to be memorized. We want you to think about what it is, um, what are the core values or core beliefs about teaching that would make this technique be effective? Um, why is this something that you would want to engage in? So um, I want you to um, brainstorm uh, in your groups, um, like three to five, what are the underlying principles that make this work? So we'll just give you a couple minutes to, uh, to do this and start in the timer. So take a couple minutes. And it's very powerful, you know, even when it's 90 correct. Ten percent got it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. They, they know the class yeah. and the data is right. yeah. yeah. Let's pull this together and hear some of the ideas that came up because I've heard some <laughs> great stuff while I was walking around. Um, what are some things that uh, that came up in your discussion? What are some core philosophies? So I, I, I think the basics is that knowledge isn't really transferred, it's attained by the students and the best way to attain knowledge is to try to teach it. So somehow the peer instruction is, or the peer discussion is an opportunity for them to try to teach each other what's going on. Right, so that there's value in, in going through that process for your own brain. Do you have one of these already? I do. <laughs> Would you like I, a chocolate? You know, I got it free without it contributing. So. Would you like a chocolate instead? I, will, I love chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> I just want to. Um, this is the Skinnerian. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is the operating conditioning. 
for me. And this actually, um, giving some sort of incentive for students who speak up in the whole class discussion can be a useful way to sort of break that ice. I've given stickers, we've got a colleague who gives the candy, um, I've given little formula books. <laughs> Do you find that you get the same students getting rewarded every time though? Um, it just sort of breaks it up in the beginning and... Yeah, it breaks down the barrier. Yeah. yeah. It's, so, Candy's so helpful because you can chuck it to the back of a large lecture. you can chuck it at someone, which <laughs> I like. You know, <laughs> you have to be a little bit careful about that, and you have to be a little playful about it, and okay. let students understand that you know this is this is a, a an externalization of, of what we want to happen in the class. Um, so, so so yeah, it's not something that you would do all semester long. Yeah. <laughs> There's other core philosophies or values that came up. I think the fact that it's peer to peer is very important. That if uh, even if you were to foster discussion between a student and a professor, they don't get the same sort of, uh, they're not engaged by it as much or don't, they, they get more take it to heart if it's from someone that's really their peers. Mm -hmm. So people learn um, better in some ways, perhaps from their peers who are explaining at their level and you know there's less of a, a barrier perhaps. Okay, great. So it's va valuable for students to talk to each other. Other, other values? Well, I think we agree they get to sort of define it in their own their own way, and that sometimes you know, in my courses, I explain like say grammatical concepts, and I don't know how to simplify it as well as I would like to. But then I hear sometimes them explain it to one another, and I'm like, oh, that's yeah, that makes sense. That's correct. You're just using you know different words than than I would, and because again, it comes from a peer, then they pay more attention to their peers than than to me. Great. So I want to sh show you a few of like sort of my core philosophies, um, just to you know, and many of which match. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So just before you get there, uh, you know, this particular question I think is a critical one. That that if you're thinking about implementing clickers in your classroom, you should spend some time thinking more about it because in the end, the writing of the clicker questions it is based on what is the purpose? You know, wh why are you doing this? What are you trying to, to help the students with in your classroom? Having that on the top of your mind when you're writing clicker questions can completely alter the nature of the questions and therefore the pedagogy in the room. So, so it's definitely like this, this is a question that we'll leave now or after, after a minute, but you, you don't really want to leave this question behind and just try to superficially come up with clicker questions. Thanks. So um, many of my philosophies match with what you, what you guys talked about, but I, I just want to highlight a few. One is that, you know, the, the, the sort of uber one is that clickers are an integral part of my lecture. They're not like an add-on. They're not something that's tacked on. They, the lecture is woven in and around the clicker questions. The clicker questions are part of the class. Um, they're not just some sort of extra quiz. Um, Another set, uh, set of philosophies is that students learn by teaching each other, which you guys came up with, and students learn by articulating their ideas, which is something that wasn't mentioned. I think that act of trying to verbally express what it is that you think is a learning process in itself. Um, for myself, one of my values that I think it's important for me to do is it's important for me to hear student ideas. It's, for, it's important for me as an instructor to hear what students are thinking. Um, and it's important for me to know what my students understand, that that feedback to myself helps me be a better teacher. Um, and I value and respect student ideas. Um, that val you know, it's not just that it's important, but that I really want to hear them because I want, um, because I feel that there's something of inherent value um, in those ideas. And I want students to know that I value those ideas. If students don't know that I value those ideas, then it's hard to have a safe space for discussion. Um, so you have to find ways to externalize um, to students that, that you think it's important. Um, and you want students to know, to, to know that they are safe um, sharing their ideas in that class. So again, um, thinking about ways to make that happen. We've talked to, to some degree about challenges. Um, we want to talk now about some solutions to those challenges. So we're going to have you go up to the board um, and write down some of the challenges that you can imagine, either ones that have already come up that haven't been, been addressed, or ones that haven't come up that you really want to get out there on the table. Um, and come up and write your challenge under one of these headings. So is it a challenge with asking the question or with writing questions? 
Um, is it a challenge with getting students to discuss with their peers? Is it a challenge with getting students to share their reasoning, for example, or something like that in the whole class discussion? Or is it some other challenge or a challenge with the, with the vote? So we're going to give you um, a few minutes to, to do this. I'll start we're one pin shot here. Um, I could probably grab one from, uh, from FTEP. So just come on up and uh, write some of the challenges you can imagine and talk to each other while you're up at the board too. And I want you to think too while you're writing it down if there's a solution you can imagine that aligns with those philosophies that we talked about. Because there's like some solution that you can come up with um, that your philosophies might help you to come up with. So um, we're going to go through these sort of section by section. Um, so let's start out. Oops. Um, so let's start out with the asking the question part. Um, let's see, and let's try to make sure to keep to to time so that we end end on time. Um, so timing of the question at the end of the section in the middle. Um, Steve, do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Um, so so the answer is. Um, all three, and uh, do you have some slides where you're going to be talking about this? Because um, I don't yes. want to. Uh, yes, yeah, why don't, why don't we actually, that's kind of a nice segue into that, yeah. into that, that next slide. Um, so so all, all those are there, are, there are uses for clickers in, in before you introduce a topic, while you're in the middle of a topic, and when you're summarizing or wrapping up a topic. And uh, different kinds of clicker questions are valuable in those different phases. Um, Shall I go yeah, through that slide real quick? And, um, so when you're trying to set up instruction and get students ready to learn a topic, you can be um, try to motivate them to learn about something with some provocative question, or find out what they already know about it, which helps you tailor your instruction. Um, during instruction, you can be helping students to develop their knowledge about um, a topic. Oftentimes, we'll ask questions asking someone to apply some knowledge that they uh, just learned. Um, or maybe elicit some misconception so that they get a chance to confront that misconception um, and uh, you know, replace it with sort of more correct thinking. Um, or finally, after you've um, done some instruction to really help students sort of recap or look at the big picture, um, you want to give them a chance to demonstrate that they've successfully learned something. Um, and you also want to give them a chance to sort of you know, look at how this applies beyond the particular topic that you talked about. So there's, there's some different um, uh, places that one might ask questions. So these are sort of, um, you know, the things that I thought about for this slide. One thing I just want to mention is the core philosophies. Again, the questions are integral to your lecture and that students learn by considering a question. So if you don't believe either of those, then, you know, your questions might end up leaning towards, like, too few, too trivial, um, et cetera. So just things to keep in mind. And we already did that. Um, so peer discussion. Um, first, what are some of the core philosophies about peer discussion and why this would be um, an effective technique? Um, we, we came up with some of them already. Yeah, did, you took a few notes. Um, I, I think we had that. Uh, students knowledge learn. Knowledge is built and not yep. transferred. Yeah, knowledge is built and not transferred. That it's useful for students to hear something from their peer rather um, who is at their level rather than from the instructor. So these are some of the core philosophies to keep in mind. So let's look at some of the challenges. Dominant peer, discussion beers off topic, getting it started. Everyone is still texting. <laughs> so yeah, the dominant peer uh, which is basically trying to manage the discussion within the groups. Like, uh, you know, is there productive discussion happening um, within those groups, or is this just one little confident student telling everyone what he thinks and everyone else is just silently nodding? Um, I'm going to ask you a bit of weigh in on, on that one again. Yeah, and I'm not sure if I have a great solution to this one. Um, when, I, when I'm doing peer discussion, I'm wandering around the room. And when I notice dominant personalities, it's fairly easy to go to a group and give eye contact to the person who's not dominant and ask for what your opinions were um, so, that, so that I can send messages about what I want to be happening. And I'm also very explicit. So as the semester goes by, I don't, I don't front load this. But all semester long, 
uh, I talk about this process. Why are we doing clicker questions in class? Why are you talking to your neighbors when you could be listening to me who knows all the answers? Or wh why would that be valuable? I, we need to talk about this because otherwise it seems like a bizarre thing to be doing with your, you know, with your valuable class time. And, um, and so you know, one, of the, one of the things that I'll talk about when I observe this happening is if you are the person who's always talking in the group, why might it be valuable for you to encourage the quiet person for once to speak so, so that you can, you can help them to understand what the purpose of the conversation is so that they'll behave in a way that you're trying so to get I'd say The discussion veers off topic and flawed reasoning are, are both about like, you know, the content about, of what students are discussing, which um, you know, Steve's idea of circulating around the classroom I think is a really valuable one um, in terms of t being able to help direct some of that conversation by asking Socratic questions that um, can help guide students, um, students' thinking as well as making sure that they're on topic. We use lo um, learning assistance as well in physics um, where we have undergraduates whose job it is to circulate um, and help us with that kind of class management. Um, if you don't have access to learning assistance, graduate TAs are a possible um, way to reach many different students um, in that way. But part of the reason we have that whole class discussion is at the end is to allow, you know, flawed reasoning to come out and give a, you know, give you a chance to address it. Right. Part of the point of these clicker questions is that we're, we're, it's, not a, it's not a multiple choice test where we want you to, to tell us the right answer. This is a communication tool where what we really want with clicker questions is for, for students to begin to engage in argumentation and, and learn what it means to argue a question rather than to just say, well, I think the answer is B. Well, I think the answer is A. Oh, well, you usually get it right, so the answer must be A. And that's, so, so we want to, to, um, to get the argumentation h highlighted. That's really the point of m many of these clicker questions. And so the, the resolution of that may be in the whole class discussion where you're bringing the conversations out into the open and you can start to say, all right, um, here was a reasoning and you've just heard it and it's flawed. You say, is there any way that we could, deci we could decide whether that's flawed or not? And, and so you get that conversation going. How can the students help each other decide how to decide when, a, when, an, argument, when an argument is flawed? So, yeah. So the, 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 the whole class discussion over time begins to feed back into how they behave during their private conversations. So Clicker is just one tool that, that you'll want to use in your classroom. And it may be that there's a time in your classroom when it would be effective to have students working on a problem and the Clicker may not be the right technology for facilitating that. Uh, sometimes this semester I've got some sophomores and I'll give them a task and, um, and what the Clicker question, the Clicker question will appear um, partway through the task, and it's, it's often um, how far along are you? You know, A, I'm, I'm at part one, B, I'm, at, I'm done with part two, so I'm just getting a gauge of how people are doing and can decide when to end that activity. So I'm just using the clicker as a communication tool in the large class setting um, as versus them clicking in the answer which might not be appropriate for that activity. One thing that I want to highlight that I think um, often people don't realize is that if you're really focusing on student reasoning in that wrap-up discussion, um, well, I guess we kind of touched that it, it feeds back. If, if you're focusing on reasoning, then students learn that reasoning is something that's important for them to be doing um, in their peer discussions. So if they're being called on to share their reasoning and they don't have reasoning because they were just talking about, well, I think it's A, but they weren't talking about Y, um, then they'll gradually realize that they need to be talking about different things um, in their peer discussion. Um, I want to give a, a, a little brief snippet of a, of a video um, that we uh, have, again, on our website about student buy-in and like creating student buy-in because it's really important for students to feel like this is something that's important for them to engage in, or else why are they bo gonna bother to, to engage in? The most important thing for a successful experience for both the students and the instructor is that everybody should buy into it. So the instructor, the very first lecture, should talk to the students about why do we use clickers. It's absolutely vital that you explain to your students why you're using clickers. And I would repeat the explanation weekly for at least a month. 
And the reason is students are used to being handed knowledge by the professor. And they don't have enough metacognition or self-knowledge to realize that figuring something out for themselves is valuable. And let's face it, it's more work. What I'll do is I'll tell them what this is all about. I'll just, I'll just say, hey, clicker questions are an opportunity for you to understand not what the answer is, but what's the reasoning. If you think about it, it's always the same students who sit in the front and the same students who sit in the back. And especially for the students in the back of the class, if they wanted to interact with you, they'd be sitting in the front. So you better make it worth their while and explain to them that if they explain things to each other, if they get more actively involved in the class, they're going to learn more and their grade is going to go up. So why are we going to be using clickers in class? It's because learning takes place in your mind, not in mine. I can prepare all these wonderful lectures and you can listen to them and you can convince yourself, oh, I understand it. But maybe you don't. For instance, if you can't take what we've discussed and turn it into plain English and explain it to the person next to you, then you don't really understand it. And we've been doing a lot of experimentation over the past three or four years. And what we find is unequivocal. If I stop the lecture three or four or five times each class, and I toss you a question that's conceptually challenging, and if I make you explain to your neighbor on your right or your left what you think the answer is, your learning is going to increase. In fact, the important part is that two weeks down the line when I give you an exam, you're going to do 20 or 30 percent better than if you simply spent your, spent your time listening to me. Okay, so it's worth your while to go through these clicker questions and debate them with your neighbors. Now, you might be sitting next to somebody who sounds really confident, and you might let that person do all the talking. If you do that, you lose. We say no brain, no gain. Okay, the learning actually comes during the act of explaining something to someone else. And so if you let John, not to pick on you, John, do all the explaining, then John is gonna get better exam grade than you are. So it's worth your while to be engaged in each one of these clicker questions. We know very solidly that if you do this, your grades are gonna go up, but that's totally up to you. The final thing uh, is the wrap-up discussion. Um, what are some of the challenges? And I think actually a lot of the things that were written down under the vote um, uh, go along with this. Um, so let's look for like utter silence, getting everyone engaged. What if nobody responds? Um, one, one thing I mentioned was, was the incentive um, to sort of break things up a little bit. One thing that I really, really like is, as a technique that you use, Steve, um, which is to lower the barrier to responding about a certain answer choice. So Steve will often use the, the um, wording instead of why did you, you know, can someone who answered A please speak up? He'll say, even if you didn't answer A, why might somebody have chosen A? Why is A a tempting choice? Um, and then you've sort of taken away the barrier of like you are de-anonymizing yourself and asking students to think about the reasoning behind all the answers. So in particular, if A is wrong and they maybe already know that because I've shown them the histogram and A only got 25% of the votes, it's very, very difficult when you first say, okay, well, why, why did 25% of the room vote for A? Mm -hmm. if, if the student raises their hand and starts defending it, they, they know they're, they're sort of looking look like a fool because they're defending the wrong answer. But the, the, the way that game works is you say, well, why, why did somebody, why would somebody vote for A? And there's usually silence. And then finally somebody raises their hand and they start explaining B. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not interested in B. I want to know about A. So this person who had the right answer has just been shut down. It's completely backwards from how class is supposed to be. They knew the right answer, they were explaining the right answer, and the professor is not rewarding them. So, so the reward is for explaining the reasoning behind the wrong answer so that we can understand what's flawed about that. And um, so that, that sometimes works. Right answer for the wrong reason. Oh, um, so problems with how the questions are written, that might be um, just a matter oh, gosh, of iter yeah, iterating. Choice questions. Um, but, but you can flaw. Y y even if, y yeah, y even if there's no problem with your question, students will often get the right answer um, for the wrong reason, which is why I suggest, even if it's like 80%, 90% of students getting the right answer, 
don't not talk about the reasoning. Always talk about the reasoning behind the answer, even if you've got a majority, such a majority that it's not really worth spending t um, too much or any time talking about the distractors. Always talk about the reasoning behind the, the right answer um, so students get a chance to get that feedback. Pointing out the error in reasoning gently so your students aren't feeling shut down for sharing their reasoning. I'm going to turn this to you because you're really good, I think, about. Uh, I can be, and and yet it still happens some semesters that I find that I'm sh that I am shutting down conversation. It only takes one or two instances uh, of a student voices an idea and and you take it down. Um, it, it it can really make it very difficult to, for for students in the you know beyond that to try to raise their bring up their ideas. So, um, so oftentimes I, I just force myself to back off. A student will state some reasoning and rather than responding myself, I, I turn it back to the class. Does anybody else have some, some other idea? Does anybody want to respond to that idea? So that the students are talking to, to each other in the classroom rather than it's always back to me. And this term to the rapid reward, when students come come forward with a with an answer, especially if they're coming forward with the, with the right answer, your inclination is to be like, of course, yes, <laughs> you know, thank you, is that, is, that, is that clear to everybody? But then students learn that as soon as you hear the right answer, you'll say what the right answer was. So I think that technique that Steve just said of, you know, hearing from multiple students and not just taking the first answer that comes along, you know, and responding to it, but just, yeah, hearing from many students on each answer um, and sort of letting the students weigh in um, before you give your sort of expert opinion. Which also relates to when to show the histogram, because the histogram itself carries weight in terms of what students think, that, you know, if it's like, you know, 70-30, students think that they know what the right answer is. But now, you know, there were 30% of the class who didn't, uh, you know, 70, 30, where 30 were percent were answering the wrong, the wrong answer. There's 30 percent of the class that has some erroneous reasoning, but you're not going to hear from them as soon as you show that histogram and show that they're in the minority. So waiting to show that histogram, um, unless it's a 50-50 split, it's the best time. Right? It's awesome. Yeah, it, like if it's like 50-50, the classroom just erupts as soon as you show that, and you get some really good debate going in that whole class discussion. So those are the questions you're you're looking for. Um, so uh, again, the philosophies are that student ideas are important and they should be brought up in that whole class discussion. It's not just about the right answer, it's about hearing all those different ideas and that students need to feel safe sharing those ideas. Um, and I think that the first bullet here is the most important, establishing this culture of respect in your classroom where students know that their ideas are valued um, and feel like they can feel safe in, in sharing them. Um, and all of the other uh, items are things that we talked about. So um, as soon as you've given the answer, you've sort of taken away that you know, need to know. Um, so waiting for that reveal um, as long as you can, I think is, uh, is really, can be really valuable. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs>I hope you enjoyed this short video. Uh, you can see other videos from our program at stemvideos.colorado.edu. And you can also see other examples of our clicker workshops um, by following the link to workshops on stemclickers.colorado.edu. And feel free to email us with any questions.